Hi, this is Dr. Bob Morey of Faith Defenders, the Apologetic Ministry of the Research and Education Foundation. There has been such a tremendous reaction to our YouTube video, Does God Love Everyone? But that video, no matter how exciting and dynamic and uh, certainly uh, very thought-provoking, did lead to many individuals who emailed me and asked me to prepare a series of videos on the subject of Calvinism. So you too must understand that when I use the word Calvinism, I have to define, document, defend, and defeat. Remember the four things that faith defenders always uh, does in terms of its research, to define carefully what Calvinism actually teaches, document it from the Word of God, defend it from attacks, humanists and Arminians, Al, uh, you know, Calminians, or whatever you want to call them, Socinians, Almoraldians, and then defeat the other systems, such as Arminianism, Socinianism, Almoraldianism, and the rest. First of all, you must understand that the term Calvinism in and of itself today, in the 21st century, is now an empty term and really denotes nothing. It is a term that is thrown around, defined in so many ways. One must be very careful that if someone asks me, are you a Calvinist? I said, I don't know. It depends on what you mean by it. What is your understanding of Calvinism? Then generally I am given some definition that no Calvinist would ever wrong. What is Calvinism? Well, I've already said it's a misnomer. It refers to a theological system that goes all the way back to the early church fathers. Now, that has been demonstrated by Dr. John Gill in his book, The Cause of God and Truth, and by many, many theologians. You can trace the Calvinistic doctrines right back to the apostolic fathers. So don't think they were invented by Calvin, that they were new. Calvin always said he was doing nothing but preaching what the fathers had preached. So number one, it's not a newfangled thing. It wasn't invented by Calvinism. It refers to a system of theology that we can find right with the earliest writings of the Christian church, right to today. As a matter of fact, I push it back uh, to the Old Testament, as D.A. Carson has proven in his book on the sovereignty of God in the Old Testament. Calvin is nothing more than New Testament form of Judaism, which believed in the concept of the chosen people. Hello, Earth to Mars. Some of these clicking now, chosen people. And the whole concepts uh, of the elect of God, which is referred to in the Old Testament as well. So it goes back to the Bible as well as to the Jews and to the Christians. Now, in order to help you to understand Calvinism, in this first part, we're just going to discuss an introduction to the five presuppositional pillars of Calvinism. That is, it rests upon five pillars. It takes all five in order for Calvinism to rest on it. If you reject one of the five pillars, Calvinism cannot stand. It falls to the ground. The first pillar of Calvinism is the absolute inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture, the doctrine of the verbal, plenary inspiration of the inerrant, infallible Scriptures. What the authors of Scripture wrote was indeed the Word of God. Now, you must understand this is very important. Calvinism says there is no such thing as free will. It's a Greek pagan concept, free will. The Bible never even mentions it. Now, what does this mean? 
the authors of the Bible were so controlled by the sovereignty of God, says the Bible, that Jesus said not one jot or tittle was put down except God wanted it there. So Jesus said not one yod, not one tittle was put there by chance, but it's under the inspiration of God. Scripture cannot be broken. Now, if Moses, Isaiah, Paul, Peter, whoever, the authors of Scripture, had a free will that is free of God's control. You know, given Murphy's Law, the Bible would have mistakes and contradictions, and it would include all kinds of foolishness of the superstitions of the age. That's why neo-evangelical theologians like Stephen Davis or Clark Pinnock and others their Calvinism went away when they threw out the absolute inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture. You cannot have the concept that the authors of Scripture had a free will and they were under the absolute control of God 100% in their minds, their thoughts. Whatever they thought, whatever they wrote was only what God wanted them to do, so you can't have the two. And that's why Reformed theology has always said free will is a Greek concept. Uh, it's nice for the pagans, but the Jews never had the concept either. Why should we Christians? That's pillar number one, the absolute inspiration and uh, inerrancy of Scripture. The second pillar is sola scriptura. I know I'm using the Latin, but you might as well get used to it. It means that the Bible is the final and ultimate authority on doctrine and morals. Now, I didn't say the only. That would be solo scriptura, not sola. Yes, there's church history, there are councils, there are creeds, there are confessions, there's theologians. They all are authorities, but when you get to the very top, the last court of appeal is going to be the Bible. It decides what is or is not going to be our doctrine and morals. Now, this is in opposition to the humanists who, instead of looking to the Bible, place man as the ultimate. So pillar number three is this. God and his word are the origin and source of truth, justice, morals, meaning, and beauty. Now that brings us to the third pillar, which is very simple, the fourth pillar now. Once you decide you believe in the Bible, how in the world are you going to interpret it? You could do Bible bingo, eeny, meeny, miny, moe, this first stays, but the others go, and you re put your finger down. You don't find God's will by opening your Bible, putting your finger down. I call that Bible bingo. The historical, grammatical, exegetical method of the original text, the Hebrew and the Greek, has been the Reformed Calvinistic method of interpretation. Any verse taken out of context becomes a pretext for history. You have the immediate context, you have the paragraph, you have the chapter, you have the book, you have the section, you have the historical culture. Now, this means the grammar and the syntax of a verse have the final say. So, so far we've seen it's the absolute inspiration of Scripture. It's the fact that God is the origin of truth, that all of the views view man as the truth. We looked at the historical grammatical uh, method. The fifth pillar is the absolute sovereignty of God and its New Testament expression, uh, the preeminence or the lordship of Christ over all things. God is either sovereign over all or he isn't. 
Now, what's most important is to understand these five pillars, including the last one, the sovereignty of God, they are the presuppositional framework of what we're going to define as Calvinism. If you throw out any of those five things, your Calvinism goes. So in this part one, I just want you to understand, if you believe that the Bible is the absolutely inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God, you've accepted the first pillar, uh, pillar of Calvinism. If you believe that God is the origin of truth, He's the measure of all things, you've accepted the th second pillar. If you have rejected the idea of humanism that man is the measure of all things, that man is the source, you've accepted the third part of Calvinism. And if you accept the historical, grammatical, exegetical method, then you've accepted the next pillar of Calvinism. And if you believe that God is sovereign over everything, then at this point, you are a Calvinist, whether, whether you like it or not. As I look forward to part two, we will look more into the issue of defining exactly what historic Calvinism teaches. This is Bob Morey with Faith Defenders.